All right, this took a little bit of effort to get going tonight. <laughs> this took some serious effort tonight. We're both out of town. Yeah, I'm not feeling so great. You're you're <laughs> in Laughlin, so I don't know how you're feeling. <laughs> I'm feeling. Oh, yeah, now you're I think freezing. Just the uh, whole internet thing. Oh no, we had it so good. I know what what happened there. Uh, we're having uh, actually my my internet, and I'm in uh, Lake. Uh, how do you say it? Cahuilla. I'm not sure. Palm Springs, and uh, my internet is working better than your internet in Laughlin. It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. But I uh, I think we're okay. All right, well, we'll go Friday. with it. And see. Happy Friday to you. I'm sorry you're not yeah. feeling well, especially on race weekend. Yeah. It's disappointing, but uh, you know, hopefully you get some good sleep the next couple of nights and uh, Sunday will be a good day for you. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just, you know, fortunately I got here uh, early and I just hunkered down in the uh, trailer and watched uh, the movies, played some chess and, and did some reading. And, uh, and if I get a good night's sleep tonight, I think I'll be fine on, on Sunday, at least for uh, <laughs> I find the best spot for that and it might be better okay so yeah, yeah you know we've talked before about like dealing with injuries and dealing with sicknesses for racing and it you know it is what it is right we're going to have these days where it's not going to yeah. it's not going to be perfect and mm -hmm. all you can do is what you can do on the day and um you know you got to make that decision you know race morning if you feel good you're good enough yeah. you race if, if you don't um you don't and it's how hard it's you know it's a hard pill to swallow. And, and I know you and I both had to swallow that pill. Yeah. But like so, you said, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, there's very few uh, race days that, uh, that are perfect. And you just have to deal with whatever the circumstances are, you know. And so I remember uh, a race one time where uh, I was camped out and lo and behold, I was camped out near a rail, uh, rail at the line. And, uh, the train just kept trains just kept running through, and I had no idea. And so obviously didn't sleep that night. But that's the way it was, and, and uh, still got up and towed the line and had a great race. And, and it's still uh, still a lot of fun. So you know, no matter what, it it'll be good. It'll be fun uh, to get going. And just trying to be smart uh, today and and tomorrow, and and, uh, and survive that nice cold water, that nice dip. Yeah, John, if you have any kind of viral thing going on, that cold water, just get your head in there. It should kill off everything. <laughs> That'll take care of it. So I don't think virus can survive in 57 degrees uh, water. Yeah, no, that's right. So maybe I'll go jump in there after this. No. Nah. There, there you go. <laughs> so um, last race of the year. It's uh, yeah. been a long season, John. I mean, you started out in Oceanside, right? I did, yeah. Yeah. So if you think Actually, about it, that's this race last year uh, as right. well. So even though this is the end of the season, sort of like a beginning of the season too. But yeah, that's. I mean, it's been a long year for both of us. Um, I, I really hope you have a successful, uh, a successful Sunday. Yeah. So. No, I'm looking forward right. to it. You know, um, we're getting back into it. I, you know, I six months ago I did uh, just about New York right around then and. You know, yeah, was able to get fitness back. You know, obviously Ironman St. George was a disaster for me, or it just was not was not my day. And then yeah. uh, New York was better. Then I raced Coca Pelle, that was better than New York. Then I raced Pump Demand, that was better than Coca Pelle. So, you know, I feel like everything's um, in line. So I'm looking forward awesome. to it. Awesome, awesome. Uh, are you looking forward to a little break? You know, I I am, but I also want to just try to carry things forward. You know, we have talked about really there's no off season. I just want to be smart. I'm not going to, uh, you know, continue continue the training pace. I'm going to back off a bit and just do some other things. Uh, but then, really looking forward to a, a 2023. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I we don't think we talked about, it, but I did not race Ironman Arizona. I was supposed to, and I I chose not to. And mm -hmm. ever since then, I've been feeling better. I've, yeah, yeah. I've been training, uh, not mm -hmm. as not as intensely. Um, and not with very much purpose right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's amazing when you kind of give yourself that freedom of, yeah. you know, I don't really have another triathlon uh, until April. 
Yeah. And the stress level goes down and yeah. it's, it's quite amazing. Like my, you know, we've talked a little before, but like I've been having hip issues all year and my hips feeling better, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and it's weird. Like I'm not training that I mean, I'm training. My load's probably 70% of what it was, mm-hmm. but that was, you know, just enough. Right. Yeah. You add that plus the psychological stress of like, Oh my gosh, I have to get ready for yeah. this. I have to like, yeah. I gotta be building all the time right now. I'm not even looking to be building. I'm just looking to maintain. And um, it's amazing. The, the difference that, you know, you can make it even in a couple of weeks, um, you know, just in, in, in your health, I'm sleeping better. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty amazing. Um, but like, there's no off season. You're right. Like I'm down in, uh, in Laughlin and I'm racing a 5k tomorrow. Right. Just because I can more than, more than anything. And um, it's not an off season. It's just now it's running season, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so easy. You know, we, it's so easy to say, enjoy the journey and obviously yep. that's been what our, our, our club theme of uh, this year and the, those words just sort of run off you know the tongue really easily to say it's not always easy to do and i think that's why it's so important to, to purposefully state all the time or as frequently as possible we've got to focus on enjoying the journey and, it, and it, it's not it's not always easy because you do get you know, wrapped up into performances, you do get wrapped up into stress of a race, and you do get wrapped up into, hey, maybe this training session didn't go well. But you still have to take a step back and say, you know what, I'm doing this because I enjoy it. And uh, as long as you keep working towards that enjoyment, I think you're going to be improving. And that improvement may not always be reflected in time. It may not always be a faster race. But, if you know, what I'm looking forward to on Sunday is just feeling across that finish line feeling like I was able to push the pace the whole time without without worry you know yeah. a little you know throw throw caution to the wind and and if I have that feeling at the end of the race that I was able to do that that's gonna be great it, no matter what the time is and so you know it I think this is always good to reflect on these moments that we have because it's not easy to always enjoy but we always have to come back to that so it's interesting. Uh, I had a conversation with somebody earlier today about this. And for me, I had to like really take a step back. And, and, I, and I think it's important for, for, for people to know. And I think, or to think about is why did I get into triathlon to begin with? Mm-hmm. It was for my health. Yeah. Right. And many age group yeah. triathletes do this because they think it's the health, a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. You know, I haven't been healthy all year. Right. And so I'm doing triathlon and it's actually been a detriment to my health. Mm-hmm. And I need to start thinking about that and start thinking about, you know what, like you're not doing triathlon to like to to go out and win races. Like I enjoy winning races. I enjoy running fast and riding fast. But the real reason I got into this was for my health. And if this is negative, then that's not good anymore. Right. right. And That's so right. I really, have, you know, been thinking a lot about this lately and thinking about like, how can I turn, you know, the injuries and the sicknesses that I've had this year around and and think about that. And like, mm-hmm. how can I be the healthiest racer for 2023? Yeah. Not the right. not the fastest. Right. Right. But how can I actually be as healthy as possible? and uh you know like literally the whole year i've been chasing health and i made some poor decisions along the way that i'm you know fully willing to admit um you know racing with shingles was a really bad idea yeah right right but it's hard to not do that that that, because you're an athlete you're a competitor you paid the money you can't get a refund you can't defer and you're you've got fitness but Sometimes we, we just can't keep digging a hole for ourselves. Yeah. And that, sure. and that hole I dug was for the whole year. Yeah. Right. You know, cause I was just, I was just trying to recover the whole year and, and I, in my hip pathology, I'm sure is because of, and, and not healing, uh, how I would hoped it would heal was based off of that. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's my, that's going to be my journey, um, moving forward is, is really looking at health and enjoyment and um yeah so 
there you go. <laughs> it's good to, you know, John, well, it's always good to say, and it, it helps make it real when you say it. No, that's right. And and I'm reading our uh, first comment uh, tonight, and uh, David says, how come every time I see the title of your discussion, I feel triggered? And I know he just did his first Ironman, Ironman Arizona. Yep. Congratulations, David. And that was a huge accomplishment. But, uh, and and sometimes what happens is, it, it you know, when you start talking more and more about triathlon, you, you have some some feelings, uh, you know, related back to that event, which is not easy. But I'm going to just write to him now. Uh, that means it's time to register for another event. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's exactly what it means. And, and we do it because it's fun. You know, yep. I'm here. Hey, I'm camping. I'm having a great time. Well, <laughs> so yeah, I think you know you have to look at do it for your health and do it for fun, and. Mm -hmm. I, I think from now on, my thing is going to be, if it's not either of those things, then I have to pivot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all right. And it's, you've got to constantly reevaluate and sometimes talk with whoever's around you <coughs> to make sure that you are actually having fun. So. Yeah. yeah. The other, well, you know, that's the, not what the, we we're going to talk about tonight, yeah. but this is actually a really good conversation. It, it really is. But I mean, it goes into what we're going to talk about because, you know, we can always pivot into anything, but, you know, we're going to yeah. talk about some running biomechanics that, you know, might not be the most sexy, but part of the, you know, part of the running biomechanics stuff is to actually um, be a healthier runner and yeah. to avoid being injured. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on my biomechanics um, running and, um, you know, I've done, used different tools and different measures and, you know, we're so lucky, you know, where we work, we can get some of the different measures um, done uh, where we work. But um, I do think that, you know, it's pretty interesting that we're able to get a lot of these metrics now from, from watches and chest straps mm -hmm. and, you know, and we can actually become healthier and enjoy the sport we want to, we want to do um, in a smart way. You know, and by using the the science and using the data that's uh, that's presented to us, um, anyone can 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 basically be a more durable runner um, mm -hmm. if they know what to look for. Yeah. So that being said, um, the article that uh, Vernice found for us this week, uh, altering cadence or vertical oscillation during running effects on running related injury factors. So this is a really interesting one to me, John, because it really kind of ties you and I together, mm -hmm. right? Like my whole thing is the injury stuff and your whole yeah. thing is the biomechanics. So yeah. I was so glad when Bernice pulled this, pulled this article for me and for us. And I was like, man, this is, this is like, this is John and I, we, it was, it was funny when we first started talking about this, John's like, well, how long you want me to talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> this could be a whole, this could be a whole semester. And, and yeah. we, when we add the injury side into it, it could be a long, this could be a really long uh, talk. But that being yeah. said, we're going to try and, um, you know, get to the, the bottom of this article and, and, and hopefully, you know, teach a little bit of biomechanics and a little bit of injury prevention and, uh, and gait retraining and things that we can actually do to uh, have an influence on staying healthy while we're running. No, oh, that's great. And, and I think this actually does help us enjoy the sport a little bit more because frankly, this is why I went back to, to school to get my master's degree and then my PhD is because I enjoy triathlon so much. I wanted to study the details of it. And yep. that led me to where I'm at now. So it's sort of fun to go back into the science part because this is our job. But then it's also our hobby, and uh, we <laughs> yeah. just enjoy this. Yeah, it's kind of awesome that it's both. Yeah, yeah. So, John, can you see, can you see can you see my screen now? I can. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna have John uh, break this down. This is some 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 pretty basic biomechanic stuff, but this it's a little can be a little bit confusing for people. But oftentimes, when you read articles or people talk about the biomechanics of running these things come up and i i really love this figure john because it kind of in a nutshell breaks down a lot of things i mean like you said you could probably talk for a couple hours over this uh very simple graph so why don't you break down what we're seeing here and how it relates or, or what it means for the average runner all right got it thanks um all right so biomechanics is in essence the physics of sport bio in this case is the human the mechanics is the physics part and 
the 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 area that that I study a lot is the biomechanics of running. And one of the key metrics that we use in understanding running or have used in the past, trying to move away, but um, is ground reaction forces. And that's what these two graphs are illustrating. A ground reaction force is just what it sounds like. It's a reaction force that happens at the ground. I don't know, it's silly. But you push on the ground and the ground pushes back on you. And that force that's pushing back on you is actually what we measure and what we study when we look at a, a lot of running kinetics. It's nothing, you know, what happens is we have a lab, we have a, 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 a instrument that we have in the floor, or we have a treadmill and the instruments under the treadmill that measures how hard you push on the ground and how much the ground pushes back on you. That's nothing more than a glorified bathroom scale. So when you stand on a bathroom scale, you push on the scale, the scale pushes back on you. And that's actually what that scale is telling us is that it's pushing back on you with 190 pounds, 180 pounds, whatever it is. And as long as you stand still, that's what that scale will read. But you know, if you've got, you know, if you have an analog scale, that's great with the dial. Uh, if you just start, you know, moving up and down on the scale, that dial wavers back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. That's because the amount of force you're pushing on the on the scale is changing based upon squatting, standing, squatting, standing type of thing. Well, that happens there in running is that when we run, our foot strikes the ground and we push on the ground and the ground pushes back on us. And that force tracing or that force uh, that that uh, pushing that magnitude varies during the course that that foot is in contact with the ground. So this um, this these two graphs are taking that pushing and looking at two dimensions. So in physics, everything's in three dimensions, for the most you know, the crazy with dimensions, but three dimensions, vertical, horizontal in the direction you're moving or side to side horizontal that you're, uh, that you're not moving, but side to side. Those three dimensions are in essence independent of each other. And we can look at each one uniquely. Um, and in this case, what, what this paper has done, it's, it's identified a vertical ground reaction force and an anterior posterior ground reaction force. The vertical is just as it sounds. It's the part of the ground reaction force that's just pushing up, or if the force is pulling down on you, which is not, it's pushing up on you. Uh, that's what the vertical is. The anterior posterior ground reaction force is the, the horizontal force that's moving, that is pointing either in the direction you're moving or it's opposing the direction you're moving. All right, so it's it's forward or backwards is what this is called. And what each of these graphs represents is a percent stance on the x-axis. That's just a fancy way of saying this is the period of time that your foot is in contact with the ground. And the moment your foot strikes the ground, which would be zero, to the moment your foot leaves the ground, which would be 100. That's a percent, all right, the way that this, this graph have done it. And you've got some data that we're gonna look at in just a bit. This could be a quarter of a second long, all right? We would say something like 250 milliseconds, something like that. So really, it's not a very long period of time. And this is that same period. This is the where the ground, a foot hits the ground, and this is where the foot leaves the ground. Typically, uh, especially the way this graph is illustrated, we would be thinking this is where the heel is striking the ground, or it could be a midfoot, could be a forefoot, but this graph doesn't really represent that. And then this would be where your toe leaves the ground. So this, this whole period here is where the foot is in contact with the ground and the foot's not sliding. The foot slides, uh, this is all, this all looks different, but it's not sliding, which is what happens when you're running, you put your foot on the ground, stays there, you push on the ground, the ground pushes back on you. On the y-axis is force, but we put, you know, this in a special unit we call body weight. And all we do is if you stand on the scale and you're 190 pounds, we would divide the 190 pounds by 190 pounds, your body weight. And we would say standing on the scale still is one body weight. If you start moving on the scale, pushing up and down, that scale is gonna go up and down and then it would just be multiples of body weight or even less than body weight at times. And so that's all this is, is just a, a force unit, but we normalize it to body weight that way graphs that you have where you're running, where you're a little lighter than me, <laughs> and where I'm running, we can compare the numbers relative to our body weight. And the numbers relative to our body weight tend to be pretty typical for runners. 
if I'm running, these would just be bigger forces simply because I'm a larger person than uh, someone who's 130 pounds or 140 pounds. And so what we see is a very characteristic curve that looks like this during running, typically heel toe running or even midfoot uh, running where the midfoot or the heel is the first part of the shoe or foot that, that strikes the ground. And what we see is this rapid rise in force right after contact with the ground. And we would call that a vertical loading rate, or we would just say, this is how fast force is increasing once the foot hits the ground. And then we see this very characteristic first peak. And this is characteristic of typically heel uh, toe runners where the heel is striking the ground first or that last third of the foot near the heel is striking the ground first. And we, we historically call that an impact peak. Boy, that was a pretty terrible circle. We call that a vertical impact or just an impact. It happens in a very short period of time, like within 10% of span. So we're talking hundreds of seconds. So very short very fast applied force to the, uh, to the foot. And that force then has to be managed by the entire body. But this is the force acting on the foot. And that, this is a pretty typical number. This is dependent on speed and some other things. Uh, but that is um, that peak tends to be about one and a half times body weight. So again, if I'm, I'll, I'll make it easier to do the math. If I'm 200 pounds, one and a half times body weight, that force would be one and a half times 200. So that'd be 300 pounds of force happening in a really, really, really short period of time. That has always been uh, hypothesized or thought to be related to why we get injured during running, both how fast it goes up and then how much this is happening. And again, this happens over and over and over and over and over again with every foot strike. You run a 5K, 2,500 foot strike. So this is accumulating over that period of time as well. And then we've got another peak out here. This is about mid stand. This hasn't really been um, related to injury as much because it's, it's a little bit longer of a time to hit this peak, even though it can be higher, like up to almost two and a half times. This is dependent on how fast you're running and different styles of running as well. And then we really don't, um, well, we won't get into this part over here. Why don't I stop there and, and focus on yeah. the vertical? I can do enter. There's a lot, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. So the thing yeah. that, you know, for, for just the average runner, thinking of like that vertical impact peak, you know, that's when you hit the ground. And yep. I often think about like the math of this as well, right? So if it's 1.5 times body weight, you did a good job of explaining that. If you're at 200 pounds and you hit and it's 300 pounds and you do that over and over and over again, and this is for one leg, yep. Yep. Right? That's right? So think about single leg squatting, 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. Can you do it 2,500 times? That's right. And quickly, too. And quickly, <laughs> right? Yeah. In a tenth of a in a tenth of a second. Yeah. Right. And so we, when we really think about this, this is a number that if we can reduce, we should be able to reduce the strain on the system as a whole. That's been the whole idea behind shoe design, running yeah. style, when you're talking about trying to minimize injury. If you're trying to run as fast as possible. You're not you're not worrying about this because well, running you're, 100 you're meters. To sprint, you're, you actually want a higher number there, right? Yeah, that oh totally. Yeah, it, these numbers will typically go up the faster you run, for the most part, depending on some other things. But yeah, but when you're yeah. sprinting 100 meters, you're not really thinking injury prevention. This is 2,500 foot strikes in 30 minutes, yeah. and 25. So, so it's a it's that repetitive loading that we have now. It, and this is what's important is that we talk about running as being an impact sport because of this. But if we land from a jump, those forces can be two, three, five, ten times as high as body weight. We did some uh, some students did some standing backflips on the port platform in the lab. They got up to ten times body weight and landing, but that just happened once. Yeah. All right. This is happening over and over and over and over and over and over and over. This is the repetitive loading nature of running in terms of why it's such a um, injury-related injury uh, sport. So one of the things that this always makes me think of, John, is, um, and I was reading an article once, I think we probably talked about it before, that said you should not run any distance unless you could do jump rope single leg for 30 times on each leg. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't do that, you haven't earned the ability to run. 
Mm-hmm. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like if you're going to, if you can't do 30 times on one leg, how are you going to do 2,500 times or 5,000 times or 10,000 times yeah. in one, like in an hour? Yeah. And, and it, and it kind of makes, it makes some sense to me, right? Like you have to have some ability and some strength and some, not even strength, but some robustness in the system yeah. um, to withstand this. And I think sometimes we're kind of cheating the system by, by actually putting people in really you know, cushiony shoes. And, you know, we're kind of like, okay, well, what's better to cushion the shoe or to actually make you more robust? Mm-hmm. And I don't like, I don't know. I don't know the answer there. I think it's, a, I think it's actually a mix of both. I think that's what the, that will, I do kind of know that's what the research shows is we actually need both, right? Well, nobody knows the answer to it because it's amazing how hard it is to, um, understand how why why someone responds the way they do to a certain direction right. because this is the, what, what you're talking about is going to the argument for why you would run in bare feet because when you run in bare feet you actually run in a different way than when you run in shoes right and when you run in bare feet you run in a way that we would say is softer on the landing well it makes sense because you've got bare feet and so this was part of the rationale for, and this pendulum for wearing shoes, not wearing shoes, has swung back and forth over the years. It hasn't just happened once, it's happened a couple of times. Right. Where, okay, put everyone in, in uh, cushion shoes. No, let's put everyone in minimum shoes or run bare feet. And now it's swinging back to uh, putting people in cushion shoes again. The problem is no matter what era of running you look at, people have always gotten injured. It's true. It's a, re- it's a repetitive loading issue. And, um, you know, the more you run, the more risk you have of overuse injuries. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough problem. It's a tough nut to crack. But, you know, but and the, and the, but the purpose of this paper really was to look at, can we make some manipulations to yeah. how we run yeah. rather than the shoes, right? How we run, can we actually decrease these forces mm-hmm. um, to potentially, because we, we think that, well, the research shows that higher vertical impact peak and even uh, ground reaction force do at least in the literature show that there's a propensity for some injury mm-hmm. right and so can we do gate retraining and there's i mean there are people that believe you should not do gate retraining mm-hmm. right and you know it depends on what side of the, of the research fence you're on but yeah. if we can if we can mitigate uh, or sort of lower the the vertical loading rate or the vertical impact peak we should be able to reduce um, some mitigating factors towards injury. It makes perfect sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not always easy to get to that spot, but yes, that is, again, why we talk about running style, like, like when we, you know, uh, the other paper we looked at uh, talked about a different type of running style um, or you know, changing shoes or changing surfaces. Or changing yeah. speed, or whatever that is, it's um, it, we're, the idea is to reduce the magnitude of that first force as well as how fast that force is going up. That's always been the idea. Yeah. So to and we've talked about this before about just teaching people to land soft, like yeah. mentally yeah. thinking about landing soft. Mm-hmm. And if you land soft, you should have a lower vertical impact peak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, a lot of the cues are land soft, land quietly, yeah. run like if you're running through a puddle. There's different yeah. ways to get that across to someone to uh, try to minimize how hard that foot is hitting the ground. But yeah. when you're trying well, to run we, faster, it, sometimes you got to hit the ground hard. Yeah, well, especially, but, but I think the racing is not necessarily the problem. It's the, it's the miles of, of training. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So when you're racing, I, I say when you know with people, when you're racing, just race. Mm-hmm. So when you're training, yeah. you want to be more cerebral and and thoughtful mm-hmm. with your with your running. So John, yeah. one of the, I think we talked about before was the, the the research study that was done that um, showed that people who listen to music have higher vertical impact peaks, and know, when they run, that and that they're I don't know if we did. I think we talked about it, but oh. so and maybe we have it, but there, there's. There is some some research here on that. No. 
Have you have you come across that study? Uh, no, I actually I love that, and uh, no, I, I can't think of the, the the paper off the top of my head, but I love that idea because it what what we're, I think you're getting at is if you're not paying attention to your running, that sometimes you can just run in a way. All right, well, let me go back. My research, one of my fun research questions I've always asked is why do we run the way we run? It sounds silly, but it's just sort of a theoretical uh, question in terms of, of looking at someone, you have unique characteristics the way you run. And I know when I see you at a race, I can see, oh, that's Ted, even though I can't see your facial features. I, I know how you run. And likewise, probably the same with me. So there's unique things about our style and I've always been interested in trying to figure out what that is. It's not always easy to figure that out. And what neat is neat about this study that you're mentioning is when you you know put music on, you start thinking of something else. Maybe you start running a different way, and that running doesn't necessarily mean you're trying to minimize impact. Or you can't hear your feet anymore. That was the other yeah, right. hypothesis. That's and, it, and that's not a and so you don't have an impact governor in your body. So, yeah. yeah. So anyways, that's, I'll, I'll find that paper. Maybe we'll, we'll bring that up at another time. So let's, uh, let's look at this uh, next chart here. Okay. And I actually will tell you some of the research I've actually done. We actually did rule out that people are not running the way they're running to minimize impact. Right. That we've actually demonstrated that, that, that's, that this impact magnitude is not a, consciously a reason why they're running the way they're running. Yeah. And I think this paper sort of goes along with that. So. All right, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, you go ahead. This is this is your area. Okay, so um, one of the things that's related to that ground reaction force, ultimately, if you do the math, is how much the body is moving up and down. And like I said, if you stand on the scale and you go down and you stand up back up, we can actually measure that um, a vertical downward and vertical upward part, and that will be related to the ground reaction force. Okay, so there's some math behind that, but but ultimately we're related. And so how much the person is going down and how much going up, we refer to as this parameter called vertical oscillation. And again, we're just talking vertical direction. We're doing one dimension at a time, which is pretty typical uh, in this work. And so what this paper did is that they were giving subjects some specific instructions on how to run. And this was all over treadmill. I read it quickly, but I'm yep, pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, it was a treadmill. Yeah. And so one condition was they didn't give many instructions, so I lied there. But they just said run as you want to run, and that's their what's called the baseline condition. That's what they're following here in each of these graphs. And then they told the person to run with a high cadence. So just take whatever cadence you have and run faster, well faster, same speed, but uh, faster cadence. And then the third condition, they told them to run with low oscillation. And I think they did give them some feedback uh, as they went along. Uh, and so what they were looking at was, in essence, um, how much oscillation they had when they focused on one thing or the other, or when they just ran as they wanted to run. And what we're seeing here is these three parameters, cadence, oscillation, and ground contact time. Cadence is just what we, we know to be stride rate or stride frequency. And when they ran without any instructions, they took this cadence right here. When they ran with the instructions to go with high cadence, well, lo and behold, they took a faster cadence. Which was perfect. The subject did what they asked them to do. And then when they ran with instructions to uh, run with low oscillation, they ran with a slightly faster cadence than what they normally would have selected, but not as fast as the highest, the high cadence condition. That's sort of neat. All right, so they they did in essence what they uh, that the subjects were told to do, or the subjects did what the uh, researchers asked them to do. This was the sort of the, the sort of unique um, yeah. observation here. And then when and they I, looked at birth, oh, go ahead. I was just saying that you know that's why I like this. The, 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 I really like this study because they actually showed, hey, our subjects did what we asked them to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because oftentimes you don't see this. In, yeah. in, in a study. And uh, yeah. so I, I was, when I first saw this graph, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're really, they got, yeah. they got yeah. what they were looking for as yeah. far as what the, the subjects were doing. Oh, and believe me, I've done this type of work where we tell people to run with a faster cadence and they will for a short period of time. And then they gravitate back to the cadence that they normally want to run at. And so yeah. it's always good to check, just like you said, did they actually use a faster cadence? And in this case, they, they did. And then they looked at vertical oscillation, 
or just how much up and down movement the person has. And uh, when they ran the way they wanted to run their baseline, they ran with this much oscillation on average around 10 centimeters. But then when they ran with the high cadence or the low oscillation, they ran with a lower oscillation, which actually makes a lot of sense because you're not moving up and, and up and down as much. Obviously they're doing low oscillation instruction, that makes sense. But it was also interesting to see the high cadence yielded about the same amount of vertical oscillation as when you were told to not oscillate uh, vertically as much. And then this last uh, graph is just how long the foot is in contact with the ground. And uh, they, uh, this is pretty typical numbers for the speeds that they were using, around a quarter of a second for uh, when the, the foot strikes the ground to when it leaves the ground. And it was uh, different depending on which condition uh, they were in. And yeah. the faster we do a cadence, the, the shorter the ground contact time is. Yeah. And that totally makes sense, right? If you're going to move your feet through faster, you're going to be have less time on the ground. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and especially, you know, if you think about it, when you did the low oscillation, it didn't, yeah. it didn't actually change the ground contact time, actually it made it a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is, and actually there's some plastic work in this area that uh, we refer to as Groucho running. And in Groucho running, what that is, it's in essence a low oscillation running. But you can actually take um, even a longer stride, but your um, your feet may not even be leaving the ground, or you may always have one foot in contact with the ground. So I don't know if you remember Groucho Marx, the way he walked, and maybe some of those older folks will really remember that. But um, it's a funny running style that was studied with this same idea. They, they weren't looking at vertical oscillation. They were looking at how soft someone could land. And if you can take that impact out and run with almost more like a shuffling, was there some advantages to doing that? Okay, so we, we, this, this is basically what we would expect to see. But so here's the, the meat and potatoes is this. So this is, this is to me, the fascinating part. So they, the subjects did what they said they were, what the, what the researchers were hoping they would do, but this is what they got. And so, mm -hmm. I'll let you break this one down too, because and, and remember, a lot of this stuff is is hopefully going to reduce injury if if done correctly. Okay, let's see. Um, they've got uh, average vertical loading right here. So this is just loading rate, and uh, this is instantaneous loading rate. Okay, so there's just different ways to look at the graph that we talked about at first in terms of how fast that, that force is going up. And then uh, braking impulse, this is uh, not the graph I talked about. This is just looking at the whether the force is pushing towards you or against you uh, while you're running. And then this is the peak vertical ground reaction force. This is, um, this is the mid peak uh, that I, I didn't spend as much time on. Uh, and so in essence, uh, now you helped me out with the stats because I only looked at this quickly while I was not yep. really that great. So um, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna cheat down here. We did measure main effect conditions. So these conditions were different between loading rates or between um, conditions. So the how fast the force was going up was influenced by uh, that. And then baseline was higher then the low oscillation, this is higher than that. And the last one is also um, baseline was higher than the high cadence as well. Yeah. So both the high cadence and the low oscillation had a lower loading rate. That means the force increased less than uh, running without any instruction. Yeah, so basically the take home here is in pretty much all of these metrics, if we um, ran or if the subjects ran with a higher cadence, they decreased the, the ground reaction force, they decreased the, uh, and they decreased the loading rate, right? And so mm -hmm. when we look at it, once again, back, back into the literature, we do see in several good studies that injury rates go down when those numbers go down. No. Right. 
And, you know, we had uh, Ron Gallagher on the, on the show a couple months ago, and we were talking about increasing cadence and how he was telling people, hey, just run faster. Like, get, or sorry, not run faster, get your feet moving faster. Don't, mm -hmm. You don't have to go any faster, just get your feet moving a little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster. And there's plenty of literature that supports that. And this is kind of breaking down why that probably works. Now, the, the thing that I hadn't seen before was where we actually had pretty similar results with low oscillation. Mm -hmm. So now it's like giving the metric of, hey, let's not bounce so much, not so much up and down, right? And looking at how many, you know, how many centimeters you're actually going up and down in the air. You know, I can remember I took a, a course, and this is a long time ago, at the University of Calgary. I mean, I was like 18 or 19 years old and I was taking an endurance sport course and uh, the, the, the teacher was like, hey, most important thing when you run is don't waste your energy going up and down. Yeah. Like, we want to go forward. We don't want to go up and down. It wasn't about like injury or anything. It was just about efficiency running, right? So not only are you more efficient when you don't move up and down a lot, you probably have less chance of, less chance of getting injured because you're decreasing the instantaneous force and the average vertical loading rate and the peak uh, ground reaction force. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're, it makes a lot of sense. Now the question becomes, and this, I hope this would be the next study they would do, is do both, mm -hmm. right? Can you, can you actually get somebody to go high cadence and low oscillation? You probably could. It, it would take some practice doing that because like I said, this is the low oscillation is more like this shuffling type running where yeah. you're just trying not to move up and down. I mean, a low oscillation, but the way that you would respond, and this is the way that their runners did, is you keep your feet closer to the ground and you may actually have periods where both feet are in contact with the ground, yeah. even though we still call it running. So that's interesting. Now, here's what's interesting. It's something that, well, maybe it won't be a big factor now because I think the rules are gonna change. Some of this, is dependent on the type of shoe that they're wearing. And if yes. they're wearing the super shoe, these results, and I don't know, but I would suspect that these results may be different if they're wearing a super shoe that um, is really designed to compress that shoe and that that shoe uh, recoil. So I don't know, that, that goes off on a different tangent, but uh, I don't know, the rules are gonna change and we're gonna have some outlawed shoes it looks like for next year. So John, it's interesting that you say that. So as you're preparing for this, I went back and looked at a bunch of my race stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at racing in a super shoe versus when I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And my vertical oscillation was basically the same. Was it really? Oh, cool. It was oh. pretty much eight, eight centimeters yeah. all the time. Yeah. 7.8, 7.9, right. 8, 8 8.1. Now here's what's interesting is we've, uh, there's actually been some good research on when you run from a um, solid surface to something really soft that compresses a lot like a foam. And what's interesting, as long as you know that that surface is gonna change that way, the amount that your head moves up and down, which would in essence be vertical oscillation, stays exactly the same. Yeah. What changes is what's happening at the lower extremity. We actually yep. saw this when we, we worked with some spring groups where the spring was, oh, probably about that thick on the shoe. And what was interesting is when people ran in those spring boots, their head didn't go up and down more. They, that stayed the same, which is exactly what you're talking about. What changed was what they were doing at the knee. And actually what they were doing was making the knee bend less when the spring boot was used because they were trying to compress that spring. And so the head stayed the same, the same oscillation, yep. but the knee, the lower extremity was doing something very different. So that may actually be what's going on with you. And so we'd have to look at what's happening at your knee uh, when you're running in, in the yep. uh, thicker super shoe. It's, it's, super, it's super interesting. Yeah. Um, and then for me, the, the, my biggest change like when I run fast, like I change, my, my, my cadence changes significantly, uh -huh. right? Like if I'm like running like one mid one nineties from, 
from like training pace is like 180 okay. and racing goes especially like yeah if i'm if i'm racing well in the 190s mid 190s okay okay yeah and but and then but my and my vertical oscillation actually goes down as well as the, the faster i go oh okay yeah, yeah. which makes this this all does make sense um mm -hmm. but I, I you know i've been trying to when i'm training i've been trying to you know at least maintain that cadence of 180 and i'm trying to um really think about landing soft mm -hmm. and, and and decreasing the, the the ground reaction force and maybe i shouldn't be because i'm you know especially if i'm running in uh like a 30 millimeter um foam yeah yeah right right well, that's cool. Well, what's interesting, what you're talking about is, you know, your your vertical oscillation goes down as you run faster. Again, this is, you change the way you run when you run at different speeds. And yep. in essence, you have, you're stiffer as you start running faster. And so you're not, you're, your oscillation is going to actually end up being less <laughs> as you go along. So that's actually pretty cool. But this is why running slow doesn't mean it's always easier. Okay, so I'm sharing this now, John. So this right, is um, this is the 5K I ran on Thanksgiving. Okay. And so why I wanted to show this is because these are metrics that are available. This is in Garmin Connect. Yeah. So this is with a Garmin watch and a Garmin uh, chest strap. Yeah. Okay. So I think a lot of people are actually collecting this data and not realizing mm -hmm. they have it or not realizing what it is. And what they're seeing mm -hmm. right so on this we have you know we have running dynamic <laughs> dynamics so i was 187 steps per minute um my vertical oscillation was 8.1 mm -hmm. right so if i was to really really focus on either one of those you know i i could potentially increase my cadence i could decrease my my vertical oscillation if i was paying attention and it's actually yeah. something that you can see on your watch you can set this up as a data field to actually see it while you're running and get, get feedback that way now mm -hmm. i was thinking this would be really cool to have on a treadmill instead of heart rate or distance actually have that metric those metrics live yeah right like that would be something that you could really do something with not that mm -hmm. heart rate aren't important but I, I do think that that's a, a would be really interesting if you could actually broadcast this to a screen um, to see these. Uh, I'm gonna maybe write a write something to Zwift Running to say, hey, let's let's see this instead of cadence, yeah, or sorry, yeah. it's, sorry, this instead of heart rate. Not that heart mm -hmm. rate. Or let's add this. Right. I can do cadence on on Zwift Running, but I can't see my vertical uh, oscillation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, there's actually some neat research in this this area where um, uh, the work that a lot of work that I've done early on was putting accelerometers on different parts of the body, and one part would be right at the head, and yep. the acceleration ultimately you can figure out oscillation from the accelerometers, which is which is all the devices in in our devices or all our smart devices are are have is it's accelerometers. And uh, there has been research on giving people real-time feedback uh, on that, uh, how much that acceleration is happening at the head and at the leg. And it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of how people respond to it. Uh, but it, I, I agree with you. This is, this is good. This is neat information to have as you go along. I do know there is a pro athlete who, and I can't remember who, who it was off the top of my head, but for his run, Ironman uh, race, he said he would only monitor stride rate yep. on his watch. That was it. And I like, oh, that's actually pretty good. You know, some, you know, looking at a metric like that, uh, but stride rate doesn't necessarily change a lot uh, as you go along, but he wanted to stay focused on that parameter throughout the course of a run. So it's actually pretty neat. Well, I know a lot of swimmers, they only concentrate on stroke rate. Mm -hmm. You know, because as you get fatigued, your stroke rate tends to go up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but has your form goggles, your heads up display changed that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because it slaps me in the face. 
it actually slaps me in the face every now and then I look at my, my stroke rate or I look at, actually, I, I paid a lot of attention to, um, when I, when I'm swimming, I pay attention to, uh, what's the one it's distance per stroke. Okay. Yeah. 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 And as I get more fatigued, my distance per stroke gets lower and lower and lower. And it gets to a point where like, I'm like, this is useless. I don't even know why I'm swimming yeah. anymore. <laughs> mm. Oh. <laughs> right, I'm going to share one more. So this was okay. So now I'm going to flip it a little bit here because I know we've talked about this this impact as being um, negative towards injury, yep. but there's also a positive side to the impact. I know you and I have talked about this before too, and brought this up on on some other episodes. Is having some impact exposed to the body is actually good for bone growth. Yes, just not just not too much. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's usually and, the recovery that you really need to focus on. Yeah, and and gra and 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 a gradual increase in impact. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to share. Uh, so shared this one with you. So this is not very fit, Ted. I'm going to share another one that is, I think maybe my best run I ever did in my life. So okay. Just thought it'd be interesting to see the difference. What when uh, time wise was that with with these two runs? Oh. So this will, this run was last week, the one that we just showed, and this is like two years ago or three years ago. Okay. So this is a 10 mile run at a mm -hmm. 16, six, eight, 617 pace. Okay. And this was, this was running really well. Like this may be my best run I ever did. This is a race and or this is a training? This was a 10, a, a 10 mile race. Okay. So you see when I'm I was running better, my my vertical yeah. oscillation was significantly less, mm -hmm. right? Almost a half a centimeter. Yeah. Now my cadence wasn't much difference, mm -hmm. right? It's only only a little bit, but my it was my vertical oscillation, and we're talking about running efficiency, right? And I think like because my speed wasn't that much different. This was just a lot longer race, so this was ten miles for three miles, so like thirty seconds per mile difference. But yeah. I really think that the key was I was running a lot more and I became a more efficient runner at this time. That's the met for me when I'm running well. That's good. All right, hold on a second. The, the bits are getting lost in Laughlin. You're freezing. Hold on. I don't know. Boston Laughlin. That that maybe that should be the next Boston Laughlin. Yeah. Okay. Go back and How say that now? again. What you you were just saying? Yeah. So when I'm running well, I've kind of noticed through the years when I'm running my best, my vertical oscillation rate is the lowest. Okay. And I think that's because the more I'm running, and the you know the more days per week I'm running, the more miles I'm running, um, I become more efficient. Mm-hmm. And vertical oscillation to me is, is a sign of efficiency as well. No. Yeah. Right. Because my cadence isn't much different on, on, on mm -hmm. this. It really was, you know, like that half centimeter difference in the vertical oscillation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's something that like when I'm you know, getting back into, you know, trying to run more, I'm focusing on that because I know that that's a metric for me that is more efficient. Right. And no, that, that's does, that make sense? does that make sense? It does. And again, this is what's nice about having having these data. You know, the other part of the equation that we're, we're not talking about, we've got speed on here, we've got stride rate, it's the stride length as well, that would come into play when you start looking at the same stride rate, but you're running a different pace, that yeah. is going to relate to how long your stride is. This doesn't have stride length, does it? Yep, stride length. So this oh, one's one is 1.35 yeah. meters. Yep. And then the race I did last week, which was a shorter race, it was 1.27 meters. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. But I'm having hip issues, so I'm not able to uh, like yeah, yeah. have that longest stride. And but the cadence was 189, or was it 180, 180, well, mm -hmm. 187, which is 190. So I mean, yep. these are all metrics that you can mess with and yep. and and look for when you're trying to become a more efficient runner. Mm -hmm. And you know these devices have become pretty accurate. So I think that was one of the other papers that Bernice sent to us was you know validating some of these different devices for getting some of these different metrics, and they're they're pretty good. Yeah. The only thing that that really it seems to be is is you have to have 
a chest strap. Yeah. Right. There, these aren't, it's not good enough just on your, oh, you can have it on the foot pod. I mean, the stride mm -hmm. does all this too, right? Like, stride, like the mm -hmm. power, power thing. But if you're going to use your watch, you got to have the, you got to have the, the heart rate strap that actually gets this data to the watch. Yeah. The watch, the watch by itself just doesn't, because the problem is, is if you, if you put your watch on the string and you spin it, that's going to end yep. up causing an acceleration on the, the instrument. And it's too hard to really get good data from the arm swinging back and forth and trying to get the impact at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So if you're gonna look at this, make sure you get a, a good watch and a good strap that actually talk to each other. And then, because it makes sense, right? If you have that, if you have the pod on your chest, mm -hmm. that I mean, that's your body, right? So that's your mm -hmm. body. It can sense when you're hitting. It can sense when you're uh, when you when you're leaving the ground. Um, that in combination with, with the watch moving really does give you a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Back when I was doing my research in the, in the nineties, we were putting, we were putting the strap on your forehead or yep. we would put it on a, a bar and you'd have to bite down on that bar. And, oh, and that man. gave us a direct connection to the, to the skeleton by, by biting down on it. But not yep. many people want to run around with an accelerometer in your mouth. So. <laughs> no they don't <laughs> all right john well hey that was good sorry the connection wasn't the, the greatest but you know it's laughlin what do you expect <laughs> that's right no that, that's good and and uh no it's always good to connect and um yeah it, it's fun talking about about this information so all right so john when we see uh we see you next week we want to see your 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 run cadence uh, and your vertical uh, oscillation rate from your rates uh, this weekend. Yeah, hopefully it's not horizontal oscillation. That's uh, ho hopefully, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll be upright and, and going at it. So I'm looking forward okay. to it. Well, once again, best of luck to you and everyone else run, uh, racing at Indian Wells this weekend. Um, yep. Last last triathlon of the year. Best of luck to everybody in the, uh, you know that's that's out there. So. Yep, all right, and, all right, enjoy John. Run, and enjoy your run in Laughlin. I will. Thank you. All right. All right. Talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye.